Back chat in Sydney, uh, still in Sydney, powered by Fleet Network. We appreciate your support this year, Fleet Network, powering the podcast. Very privileged once again to be joined by another great guest. Uh, this man doesn't play footy anymore, but still very much involved in the game. Uh, and we welcome and appreciate you being here, Jason McCartney. How are you, mate? Well, thanks. Uh, great to be here. It's good to have you. Now, um, I know you're probably a very big big fan of back chat. So, look, I'll explain it just in case you haven't been listening, Jase. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, across it. Yes. Now, um, we ask our guests every time we have someone in here. It's the first question we ask. We want to know your greatest sporting achievement. But we know what you've done in footy. We know you've played in grand finals, in prelims, in big games, huge games. We know you've played across three clubs. Like we, we know you've had a great career. We know you're the list manager of two clubs. You've won a premiership as a list manager. We know that. But we'd just like to start with, we don't care about that right now. We'd like to know your greatest sporting achievement, not on the football field. You've got me thinking, and instantly it would take me, especially off the back of what's going on, obviously, uh, in the UK at the moment with our cricket sign over there. Growing up in country Victoria, I just grew up AFL in the winter and in the summer it was cricket. So it would have been my first 100. Wow. I was about 15 years of age playing for Nil Blue in the uh, West Wimmera District Cricket League. And um, yeah, it was just a, just a great feeling because you're playing against, like your junior footy career back in the bush, you're playing against men all the time. So to, to peel off 100 was, uh, yeah, it was a, something I'll never forget, that's for sure. That's a long that's time. Good. That's a long time out there, isn't it? I mean, you're not smacking them around. Well, uh, no, no, them? I was there for a quick time, not a long time. <laughs> you know, being a bit tall and you get sort of, sort of quads and that leaning over that bat, so you want to throw the willow around a bit. So uh, <laughs> I was probably ahead of my time with this baseball phenomenon, really. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me that you actually introduced it to the game, James. That's very good. 33 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so country, Victoria, what's, what's life growing up? For Jason McCartney, how, sporting? Yeah, sporting. How was family. great. Uh, lived in town. Only town was about 2,000 people. But, yeah, it was heaps of sport. Like I said, the the summer was cricket and midweek basketball. AFL in the, in the winter and a lot of travel because when you're making rep sides and your mum and dad's taking you down to Melbourne, whether it be under 15s or the old Teal Cup under 17s, you'd generally play at nil or in the, around the district on a Saturday. And then Sunday morning, you'd be... Mum and dad would be, you know, waking up at sort of three or four o'clock to do the four hour drive down to Melbourne for a training session. So they sacrificed so much. But it was just a great upbringing. You were just always outdoors, uh, motorbikes, uh, shooting, a lot of hunting, uh, ferrets, had the ferrets. So I loved <laughs> the ferreting and the rabbit trapping. So all those things, uh, stump, stump picking, cutting wood, and then we'd sell it like great dad had set that up for us. And it was great pocket money for huh. got two younger brothers. So yeah, it was wonderful. And I was obviously, uh, I left at sort of 16 and a half because the draft age was different then. So you get drafted at 16. So um, I was gone very early, but yeah, it was just a, it was a really good upbringing. We are, we've been asking about first cars, Fleet Network, big supporters of the program. Uh, they're big, big. Uh, supplies of cars around. I've been asking about first cars. Yeah. Were you, did you have a paddock bomb you used to drive around? And then if you got drafted as a 17 year old, like how you, how you get that Yeah, out? so no, we didn't have the paddock bomb. It was yeah, some old motorbikes we had. Uh, but then when I got to Collingwood, um, I bought a car early that had to obviously sit for about a year and a half in mum and dad's garage back in Nil. And it was just a, it was a, just a Holden Commodore, pretty stock standard. Yeah, nice. And it sat there. Um, yeah, no one touched it for, 18 months until I got my license. And obviously back then, so you'd never get your license in the city. You'd go home. Um, you'd usually know the local policeman back in the day then, and he was probably aware that you'd been driving around as an underage or a little <laughs> bit around the back street. So it was pretty much a quick drive with the local um, policeman and then you got your license and I Is hopped in the was? car and drove back to Melbourne. Is that what it was back in the day? <laughs> it was, yeah, why, it was. Why did you buy it? Why'd you buy it? Why'd I buy it? Yeah, why'd you buy the car? If because I got... Well, at 16 and I got my sign-on bonus, I thought, <laughs> Better do something that's with buying it. a car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you get drafted to Collingwood. Yep. Are you a huge Essendon fan? Oh, yeah. You, yeah, were, you were filthy, weren't you? <laughs> oh, I was shattered. Absolutely <laughs> gutted. So the, once again, everything's changed so much. Like the drafts, it's a big production now, but I didn't even get to listen to it anyway. I just heard um, on, it would have been 3WM out of Horsham, the local radio, and just on the hour, on the half hour, the updates, and it was I'd been drafted to Collingwood. And the biggest shock with that, I, I'd had interviews with every club, and the other club that I hadn't had an interview with 
And it's funny that Gabby Allen was in charge then. And I, I live with Gabby and obviously work closely with him uh, and against over the journey now. Really? But, and they just beat Nesson in a grand final that year, like their first premiership for 32 years. And I had mates who were Collingwood supporters and they used to give me the shits all the time. And um, <laughs> yeah, I was in tears at first. Because you, you had you had Bombers posters yeah, up on the yeah, wall. Who, yeah. were you, who were the players you looked up to when you were... Yeah, you know, so man. the posters, which is funny, it still feels like yesterday. <laughs> the Duna cover, pillowcase, wow. yeah. and posters all over the wall. And 84, 85, back to back, flogged in 83. But it was... It was a lot of the local guys because that was the old Essendon zone. So Tim Watson, just up the road at Dimboola, huge fan. Uh, Merv Nagel was Dimboola. Roger Merrick, Caniva, Glenn Hawker, Caniva, Shane Hurd, Horsham. So uh, it was all going on around me. And then obviously before I got drafted, both uh, Dean Wallace and David Flood, who were from Nil, um, they were at Essendon then as well. And Johnny Barnes, who was a bit of a lunatic Barnesy, but he was spent time in Caniva as well. So it's just that that affiliation. And probably for me, it it was great to be able to see people from around your area because when you're growing up in a small country town, it feels like it's so far away. But when you've got all these guys who've been really successful that come from 30 k's up the road, it gives you that belief that it's actually possible. So, mm. and that's really what inspired me. John Barnes, one of my favourites, Geelong, number six, Ruckman. Yeah. But he, 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 he played like a true Ruckman. But just used to do some things, Barnsley, and just be thinking, what's going on here, John? Absolutely. What are you actually thinking about? And he finally got his, uh, yeah, after missing out Geelong a few times, he yes. uh, got that flag back at Essen. That's right. Went full circle. Mm. So you're, you're a high draft pick. Yeah. Pick yeah, four. Pick four. So What um, were you? Backman, forward? No, I was actually a key forward, but I'd played in the Teal Cup, so the old under-17s, which is now the under-18s nationals. Uh, my coach there, I, I played as a 14-year-old, so I played – three years advanced and slug the <laughs> legendary slug jordan late great slug jordan was my coach and um yeah throughout that uh, sort of lead up to that champs he just threw myself and a forget the other kid he was from st arnard i think sean slater his name was but we were sent half forward full forward and he thought i'm going to put you sent half back and full back and that's where i played as sort of a 14 15 year old through the under 17s um, and ended the AFL probably as a forward, but there's no doubt as the career um, progressed, it was as a key back that I'd finally sort of cement my spot and make my name. So you drive to Collingwood, okay, you're not happy to be there, but, you know, you're on an AFL list. Mm. They've just won a flag, haven't they, 99? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, um, yeah, just won the flag. But the moment I walked in the door, it all changed. Like, to see uh, Peter Dacos, the late, great Darren Mullane, Mick McGowan, Gavin Brown, Tony Shaw, Krasiska, Stasevich, that it was just, it was an unbelievable experience. And they looked after me really well. And, you know, you talk about the life lessons and life skills you gain. Well, you know, I'm 16 and a half and you're learning a lot. You're learning some good stuff. You're learning some pretty ordinary stuff too. <laughs> like that spar on a Monday was, was interesting conversation, but um, <laughs> times have definitely changed. But uh, yeah, I ended up having four years there and I probably... Um, yeah, I had some success. I probably played my best footy there when Craig Kelly actually did his knee and was out for 12 months and they put me back to centre-half back and uh, it was, was going pretty well there. But ultimately, Gary Pert, who was a star at Fitzroy, came to the club and probably thought my days were a bit numbered there and, you know, Adelaide come knocking and I was had a bit of an affiliation there. Growing up at Nil was halfway between Melbourne and Adelaide, so I thought it would be a pretty seamless transition. Yeah. How did you go playing Essendon the first time? <laughs> Well, the rivalry was uh, was huge. So it was, as much as I love them, once you start playing against them, and definitely the Collingwood experience, and uh, not as much Adelaide, but we'll get to the north, there became a great hatred then very quickly <laughs> because, yeah, that, especially the Collingwood and then the north Essendon rivalry being the, the near neighbours was quite fierce. So the opportunity comes for Adelaide. Um, yep. They come knocking. Um, you move there in 95 have, have have some really good footy there at Adelaide. What was your time like there? Yeah, it was interesting because we – so Robert Shaw was the coach. Uh, that was a really good fit for me. Obviously, he coached um, he coached Fitzroy. Um, we probably – you know how you can hit it off with a coach, similar styles. He was a very defensive, very structured. Anal the way he analysed the opposition, he was ahead of his time with that. And me playing as a defender probably suited my style – but that group we had at Adelaide, it didn't really suit that style because predominantly back then, they were nearly all South Australians and they had a lot of flair and so it probably wasn't the right fit. And 
Doesn't help. Uh, Sean Wren was just an unbelievable ruckman. He pretty much missed nearly two years with knee reconstruction. So we didn't have uh, great success. And after two years, obviously they made change and Malcolm Blight come in. And Malcolm uh, really did fit that group because he was the opposite. He was all out attack. Yeah. So um, for me though, I didn't play much under Malcolm. I only played about the first six games in, in 97, which ultimately we, we went on to win the flag. So yeah, after some pretty solid form in the first couple of years, um, that third year didn't go well. And probably the biggest thing for me being at Collingwood, you're in the spotlight a lot because it's you know one of the bigger clubs, if not the biggest. And as a 16 year old, they've just won the flag. You pick four, it's their first pick. This, this you know great white hope. And then you go to Adelaide and it was nearly worse because there was one team town. So the focus yeah. and the attention by the media over there was um, was probably even bigger. So um, it was great. It was a great experience. I probably, to be honest, being at the age I was then, there's probably uh, there's some solid footy there in the first couple of years. Not great in the third, but it was probably a bit of fun off field in that period of time because there was a good young group coming through. Um, we did have a lot of fun, um, but ultimately being around a club that wins its first premiership ever, um, it was was special, albeit. You know, you're not out there playing, so. Yeah, do you do you remember that? I mean, even though you're not at the footy club, Colin, where they come off the flag and you're around yeah. that winning culture. Yep. Adelaide, similarly, a young group build up into a grand final that you win. Like you say, you're not in that team. Do you remember, like, you remember 97? And was, oh, absolutely. Did it, did it hurt yeah, at the time, yeah, or were you yeah. happy? Well, you're happy. There's a bit of hurt, but I suppose because I'd only played that first six games, it wasn't like I'd played – you know, the first final or the last home and away game and then didn't get back in. I was, I was probably on the outer there and left some form was good. I just didn't get close enough to crack back in. Although you were, you were training as best you could and hanging on to that hope that maybe an opportunity would present. Um, so, yeah, I remember it. It was, uh, it was good fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I still remember the prelim final day, Adelaide Bulldogs. The guys that weren't playing, we trained and we stayed in Adelaide. And we were given the task of, if this goes pear-shaped, you boys have got to get Mad Monday sorted. <laughs> and at half time, we were a long way behind and we had everything booked. <laughs> the next half of footy transpires and we've got up by a couple of points. We had to put some cancellations out there that <laughs> kind of didn't need to make the call because everyone was across what was going on. So, um, yeah, it was an amazing week. The, the crowds at training that week, grand final week, was quite phenomenal. They, they needed, um, uh, you know, organising you know, the traffic around the ground and parking and everything. And it was yeah, quite quite remarkable. And the, even the grand final day itself, we there was a group of us that only flew over on the, the Saturday morning and yeah, just being, being their grand final day. And once again, I think the first half, the Saints probably had our measure, yeah. 13 or 14 points down. And then the second half, we just had front row seats to the... Darren Jarman show really and McLeod and Goodwin and yeah, it was quite phenomenal. So um, yeah, sort of really come from nowhere. And I think both years at Adelaide won 97, 98, I was on the other side, obviously not top four sides, sort of come from outside and did it the hard way. Um, so yeah, so not not as much of the disappointment we'll, we'll touch on later on, but it was just great to be part of. Yeah, well, I mean, like just, just you know, looking at your career before we sat down to chat, I, Oh, I feel like it's one of the most remarkable footy journeys I've seen, really, and that that's intertwined with yep some some you know, missed opportunities and yep. disappointments. But you're around six. You played in some great sides and some great yeah. players your whole career. You you weren't playing with sides just yeah. making up the numbers. No, it was an exercise. I think I went through when I finished playing, and I just looked at those three cl clubs that I'd played at and. We talked about the success Collingwood had had and then obviously that period at Adelaide, uh, which was one flag when I was there, ultimately two, and then into the North Melbourne era. And it was like, the, I, I picked two teams of like, you know, best probably 20 at the time. And he was quite phenomenal. And <laughs> yeah. like, you're talking premierships, all Australian, 250, 300 game players. They're two really powerful sides. And you, and you sit down at the start and you'd love to have, been the one club player and go all the way through, but it, it wasn't to be. But I, I think of the journey and the the opportunities I got to play with some just there's a hall of famers everywhere. Yeah, um, it's it's quite remarkable. So that '97 Adelaide Grand Final, you don't uh, play in that. You get traded the next year. Yeah, to North Melbourne. Yep. So I, I I really thought I was done and dusted. I've had 75 games over seven years to that stage, 
and I was preparing probably for you know life after football, which would have meant probably I, I really enjoyed it in Adelaide. I probably would have stayed there. I would have thought like the opportunity maybe to get in that development space but I just would have played sandful footy I, I would have imagined and probably with a view to maybe go coaching at one stage but um yeah I had I got wind of a journey but I didn't think much of it that North may have had an interest and it was all off the back of them winning in 96 97 they lost a prelim um, and they had the retirement of Ian Fairley so there was, there was actually position specific as a key back came up and I remember Dennis Pagan, the coach at North Melbourne, he, he came to see me and it was like three days after the grand final. He came to see me at my place at Westlakes at the time and three days after a premiership win is not ideal timing for so a visit. that would have been a, the Monday or the Tuesday. Uh, it would have been Tuesday, Wednesday. So um, <laughs> You would have been uh, in all sorts. Dusty. Hello, dusty. hello Dennis. But he, um, I, I'll never forget, he just had this A4 piece of paper and I look back and I understand now, like you start off as the early draft pick, you're chock full of confidence, but now you're in the, in the big pool and slowly but surely you get knocked around a bit to the point where I was just lacking so much belief and confidence. I, I could even play at the level like Blighty's the master coach. We just want to flag at Adelaide. I wasn't part of it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not for me, the AFL, but Dennis on this A4 sheet of paper, he was a backyard psychologist Dennis and he just had all these things about what's good about Jason McCartney and he he made me feel really good about myself and I thought this you know this could work but then I went to the Perth on I reckon the Friday with some uh, Adelaide Crows teammates and we we're there for a couple of days and then we we're going to Bali and when push come to shove it was the the, the deadline of the trade and I said no nah, I'm not doing it I'm finished really I'm finished and the one thing I can never remember, I remember uh, my late father and my two brothers, I was chatting to them and they were going, just, are you sure about this? Are you sure? Because, you know, you don't want to have regrets. Like, it feels like your career is unfulfilled. And this is just a one-year opportunity to go and give it everything and just see how it works out. I know, can't, no, I can't be bothered. I'm, I'm done. I've had enough. And I had one, Dennis just made one more phone call and I can never remember exactly what he said, but it was no doubt that it was the conversation with dad and my brothers, but then also whatever Dennis said, that I jumped on that plane to go to Bali and um, I knew I was going to North and it was just, yeah, give it everything you got for one year and see what happens. Um, and that's, in my footy career, that's the, the best decision I ever made because that one year ended up being six years at... <laughs> A club that was just, I think, every year bar one I was there were were challenging in around prelims and grand finals. You was, spoke, oh, sorry, yeah. was, that, was that like a, a switch for you? Like as soon as you you like came okay, I in, like you had full belief that you could do it, or did it take some time for you to start to yeah, get it took, that back? It took some time. But the one thing about Dennis, he promised me that if I if I come over, there's no guarantees, but he said what I will guarantee, if you do the right thing, have a good strong preseason, I'm going to play you. There's a position there, and I'll play you. And I'll give you a good block of games there through the preseason. So all of a sudden you're lacking that self-belief and you've got someone who's believing in you. And I played okay and you make a few blunders where normally you think, oh, I'm going to be out, but he stuck by me. And then with each week, you just rediscovered that belief in your own ability. Um, and that was that ended up being a, you know, a pretty strong year for me considering where I'd been. And, and, and we played in a grand final, so... You've been list manager at two AFL clubs post career, Bulldogs and GWS, yep. current role. Yeah. Um, just jumping forward, and we'll come back to where we were. But do you think about experiences like this with Dennis Pagan and Malcolm Blyde yeah. and the players you played with? You'd have to you'd have to be using this in what you do now. Yeah, right? absolutely, you do. We know it's changed a lot, but although there's a number of things that changed in the game, there's the basic fundamentals have never really changed. Yeah, and that's you know, rewarding people that have the right attitude and attributes, really. Um, so you, I'm always conscious in that role at the Bulldogs, that list manager role, and then it, onto the Giants, and obviously now still doing that, but that broader role as a, as a GM. You, you just got to make sure that you always take a deep breath in a situation and reflect back to, hey, I've been through this. And I reckon it's a bit easier when you were never a star because you had to do it the hard way. I reckon it's a bit harder for the some of the stars of the game, even with coaching, they just mightn't get how hard it is. 
if it's become very natural. But I reckon the ones that have had to work really hard at it and had some some probably more lows and highs, you just got to make sure. Because I reckon there's some sometimes early in the role, the Bulldogs, are, you know, I wouldn't reflect on that enough. And you just got to put yourself in that player's shoes in that situation and go, yeah, yeah, I know what you're going through because I've been there. Um, and you just have a little bit more empathy around it. Helps with your decision making. Um, and I, I think it helps you in the role. The, positive, the positivity element of Dennis Pagan, I think Dennis, De people who don't know Dennis like you would, yeah. would look at Dennis Pagan and think, you know, harsh, yeah. you know, ruthless coach. Yeah. But to come and rock up at, yeah, you know, a kid's house with a piece of paper telling him how good he was yeah. when he didn't think you were good. That's right. It's pretty. That's a pretty strong message. Yeah, it? it was. He was. He was a remarkable coach. There's no doubt about it. And we all, I would say, probably ninety five percent of us look back now, and we would all say Dennis had a massive influence not only on our playing careers but shaped us beyond football and in life. And at the time, we didn't see that though. We just thought he's a hard ass. Give us a break, please. But what we now know is if he if he wasn't riding you, then you're in strife. Didn't ride you. <laughs> yeah. So he rode most of the guys. He thought, oh, they, I can get the best out of them. And in essence, that helps him and helps the club. So, yeah, it was hard at the time. And he used to butt heads occasionally. But, um, yeah, he was wonderful. Dude, he was wonderful for us. Yeah, he would have had some all-time sprays, all-time yeah, yes, I, I, don't know. I, I don't know if any spring. Oh, about. look, he's got a number of paganisms actually. That <laughs> we we used to have the footy trips were big back then, and the North footy trips were legendary. Like forty four guys on the list, and nearly every player would go every year. And we could sit around and play drinking games, just regurgitating all the paganisms and things <laughs> like that. So it was wonderful. I remember my last. It might have been twenty twenty one. I was coming back from injury. I was out of the side returning playing vfl and it was training was just so hard then too and um the afl must have played on the saturday and we had the training we played on the sunday and monday it was kind of just match play anyway and it didn't matter if you played the day before and i i, I spat it with him and it was the wrong thing because it was in front of the group but um yeah he didn't take too kindly to being <laughs> harshly spoken to by a player what in front he, of the group what did he do? <laughs> no 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 it was a stare that i'll uh, i'll never forget <laughs> um, but he was just I talk about the psychology of it all and it was it was fascinating like i went a number of times he used to have a um, i think it was pellegrini's a little restaurant in the city and he'd grab you by the by, sunny i'm gonna take you it's time to go for a bowl of pasta or, or a bowl <laughs> of soup and you'd meet him at the club at arden street and he'd drive you in there and you'll have had the conversation on the way in there so then you have the pasta or the bowl of soup and it's like you're struggling to make conversation then and then you got the trip home um but yeah i, I had that uh, a couple of times but he also used to talk often about because uh he lived in essendon and uh puckle street mooney ponds the, the main strip there so he'd often talk about uh, sonny i need to get you down to puckle street to the confidence shop <laughs> so, <laughs> down the confidence shop so uh yeah he in his time, it, it really worked and really worked for our group. So, so you get traded there at North, North Melbourne in yeah. 98. So 97, um, Adelaide, you missed yep. that grand final. Yep. Yep. 98, you played in grand final, first year at the club Yep. against Adelaide. Yeah, so side. the irony of that is it was the prelim was Adelaide Bulldogs again, huh. as it was a year before. And um, we've got through on the Friday, I think, from memory, and then Saturday that game and – and Adelaide smacked them. So all of a sudden, they've come from nowhere again. And as great as it was to be playing in a grand final, it was this, it's kind of like, oh, not these blokes. They had their go last year. Like, this is, I missed out. This is my turn. And we were, it's amazing how footy works because in um, 98, we were, the, we were the best side by, by a fair streak. And um, we dominated them in the first half. Um, but we were so inaccurate. I think the end of school, we, I don't know what Christ kicked, but we were eight goals, 22 or something. <clears throat> and we really cost ourselves. Wow. Went in at half time, we're four goals up. It felt like we should have been 10. And they, they started to overrun us in the third. I think we might've kicked a goal at three quarter time. that got us back within a point. But I remember going at three quarter time and you just knew we were gone, we were gone. And again, it was, it was Jarman, it was McLeod, Goodwin and Rashudo and these guys. So. That was that was really tough because that's the best day of your life in a half a footy turns into the worst. 
and I'm watching my good mates again run around with the, the cup and premiership medallion. So, yeah, that was that was a real tough on that. Had, had the um, had the, your team come to you for any sort of intel? You know, playing your old team in the grand final. Yeah, I remember talking to Dennis a bit about it all. Um, it's one of those things. Like you do, you do lean on whether it's players or staff that have moved from other clubs. But yeah, well, everyone was pretty aware of how Adelaide played. It was a pretty aggressive attacking style of footy. And, you know, they did they did some things which is very common now. Like we had a really strong team at North and we had a pretty set midfield and you didn't need to rotate much at all um, those days. But obviously Adelaide had done it the year before and they certainly did. The grand final day in 98 was, um, was 29, 30 degrees. It was warm, it was blustery. And we'd just come off the back of 10 weeks in a row, including finals, where all night games. And um, it, it got us and they got us and they started, Blighty would flick the magnets around and they were rotating through the midfield and they, yeah, they blew us away. We just, we just couldn't go with them in the end. So that, when I look back at everything, there's been a lot happen. I, I look back with disappointment on that one because of, we're just so superior that year. And I think even the other North boys that ultimately played in two premierships, that's the one that eats away at them because we probably should have walked away in that period with with the three flags but grand finals are a funny day and anything's possible you you given the journey you've had in footy you, you're able to reflect on grand finals which to, to be fair some people can't yeah. either. they don't get those opportunities yeah. so are you able to at the end of it all look back and you know be you know thankful yeah and, absolutely all that, of course yeah yeah so i can i can talk about it and, and remember so much around that game. I won't watch it though. Oh, I won't watch it. You do get caught end of season. You, the kids might see something on Fox footy and they are the old grand final. So you watch a bit, but yeah, I'm not, it's not a game I'm sitting down. Uh, I think I'm a little way off that. Even that was a long time ago. I'm watching that whole one, um, the replay of that, but yeah, you just, you just got really good memory. So yeah, like ultimately you want to be, playing and, and winning a grand final. But then the other part, and obviously what transpired later on, I'm just very grateful to still be around, but it actually, to look back and I know there's so many players that just don't get that opportunity to experience grand final day. So over that period of what, three years, I was at clubs that was were involved, um, three grand finals in a row. So to experience the, the build up, the week, the parade and everything that goes around it and then the day is, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty lucky, that's for sure. And the fans, right? Like you, you've, you've been involved in at least five, no, six clubs I can think of, six yeah, AFL yeah, yeah, clubs. Yeah. Yeah, like the, the the fans, it'd be fair to say you know, kangaroos right now, they're not where they want to be, but but that like I imagine Arden Street at the time in these, you know, late 90s, yeah. like, for, like parochial fans. Yeah, yeah. Nuts. Yeah, going, going on stage after you know, after we lost in 98, but 99 on the Sunday, like rock stars. And it makes me sort of fast forward to the list management role at the Bulldogs when we won that flag in 16. As amazing as that was, I wish now I could go back in time and not be in the roles off a field because that's great. You're in a sanctum, you're a big part of it. I wish I could experience what the fans experience. And what I mean by that is, um, you only have to go and have a look at YouTube and everything now and all the footage on there of what it would have been like um, in a pub in Footscray. Even through that whole fight, finals campaign yeah. is quite remarkable. But grand final day in a pub in Footscray, what that would have been like in the streets of Footscray. The Sunday I drove past, we were going to a pub to meet the players. I, I didn't even try and get into Witten Oval because that was just a sea of people you could see it. So it's unbelievable where you're involved, but then the 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 kid that's always grown up loving footy, you'd love to be able to go, geez, that's great, but I wish I could have experienced a, a little bit of the other as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and there's, and that was certainly the case at that, that period at North Melbourne. 99, um, so 98, uh, you lose that grand final, 99. Uh, good season, you're in the team, yeah. playing well, uh, prelim final. It's, it's, a, it's a good year for the club. I mean, North Melbourne win the premiership. Yeah. You're playing in the prelim. Yep, yep. Uh, Backman. Backman, yep. Um, Always make a contest, Dennis, regardless how late you are. Yeah, it's a funny one, that, because I talked about us being clearly the best team in 98 and not winning. Yeah. 99, the best team was Essendon, and they got beaten in a prelim by a point. They didn't make the grand final. So we played, we played Brisbane on the Friday night, 
and they were Lee Matthews was coaching then. That's the start. So this is a, start, yeah, yeah, this is, you know, Voss is young, young Simon Black, Akinmanis. Lynch is firing. Kind of Brownie would have been a, maybe just starting out, but uh, Daniel Bradshaw, mm. that real powerful side in the making. And uh, close, relatively close game. We had them covered. I've played every game that year, had a really strong season. And yeah, just it was late too. It was late in the last quarter. Uh, Clark Keating, uh, great September specialist in Brisbane. Absolutely. Sometimes he missed a bit during the year, but he always found his way back when the um, when the whips were cracking come finals time. And it was funny, a great relationship with Mick Martin, the North fullback, so were the, both the key defenders. And I remember Mick was playing on him and I, I covered for him and it's just, uh, I still remember the spot on the ground on the Shane Warren stand side now, punt road end, about half forward. And he's marked in front of me, and I just always remember that thing I talked about before with Dennis. You've always got to have a physical presence. And I knew I was going to be late, and I had a very bad habit, and I've been reported a couple of times, on the the ruck size taller forwards, the 200 centimetre or ruckman, that I'd be a bit round arm with my spoiling technique. And I knew I was going to be late, but I thought I just it was just natural. And I thought I just would have hit him in the in the shoulder, and he knows I'm around. But when he marked it, he didn't land on his feet. He dropped to his knees. So shoulder became smack bang across the nose and he's sort of the trainer comes out and he's on his haunches and I'm reported straight away. Darren Go uh, Goldspink was the um yeah, Goldspink was the umpire. Reported straight away. And she's like, oh, no. I know this isn't gonna go well. And then he runs off the ground, he takes the bloody the white towel away from his nose, and that wasn't a great sight. Um so anyway, here we go. We're off to the tribune and I, I knew I was in strife and I ended up getting four weeks. Because uh, back then they'd add a bit of loading onto your history. And the irony of it all is, I actually only ever missed one game. Because back then you could serve your suspension in the pre season series. Oh, and yeah. in 2000, we progressed through to the grand final of the pre season series. So I was able to play practice matches with the reserves before our night pre season series. And then I served the other three weeks there and then played in the night grand final. So I only ever missed one game mm. um, for that four week suspension, and it was a grand final. And I hadn't missed a game all year. And um, obviously, uh, yeah, I think for me, as bad as I felt that Friday night, yeah, Saturday, Essen's playing Carlton, and you, you sort of, we, we knew Essen was the best side. And it probably wasn't until 4.45 when that siren went on Saturday. That's when it went from I'm missing a grand final to. I'm missing a premiership because mm. there's no way there's just no way Carlton was going to be able to repeat that against us the uh the next week so that was a tough week that was a really tough week so once again I, I suppose I, I drew on my experiences from the year before like team sports about team success the disappointment of us losing the year before when I was at the club I put on a very fake brave face I was shocking at home um but uh, it was funny that the back end of that week, I felt like I probably had my best training, a couple <laughs> of training sessions I'd had for a number of a number of weeks. And then all I could do was be there grand final day and support as best you could. Um, I couldn't sit down. I, I stood in a race the whole game and was a bit tired early, but we kicked away. And um, yeah, I, I just had great support from so many people around the club and that, making you feel a part of it. But uh, with their best endeavours to make you feel part of it. I just know I'm not because once again, I'm in a suit. The boys are up on the dais with the medallions and the cup and they make you feel part of it. But you know, you look back in history and you're actually not a premiership player. So that was, that, that period was tough. And then probably the weeks and months that followed, that was as low as I'd been because you're just thinking, it's just eluded me now a couple of times and, you know, we've still got a good side, but do I, do I get that opportunity again? And, Ultimately, uh, got to a prelim the next year, um, but we didn't get there. And then we'll, it was probably the end of that that era of North Melbourne being such a dominant force. Was there someone in particular that took your spot? At the yeah, yeah, finals? that was a great story. Uh, Cam Mooney. So Cam obviously no played in, Yeah, Cam Mooney uh, and um, Cam won't, won't mind me saying this. Played a good game. <laughs> his contribution, <laughs> stats-wise was exactly the same as mine that day, standing in the race in a suit. <laughs> Cam had donuts for the whole game. Wow. 
So his, his strongest contribution is Anthony Stevens, who was a star. He went into the game with a fractured ankle, but he got up. He got up and he was on fire in the first quarter. Uh, and then ironically, he tore a pec muscle. So it wasn't the ankle that slowed him up. So he was out of the game. So Moons' greatest contribution was carrying Steve around on his shoulders when we're doing the lap of honour. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously he goes to Geelong and um, he, what, he playing at least another couple there, yeah. So has he played much through the season? Uh, maybe a handful of games. He's like, he just on the fringe, mm. yeah. So Great he was time. just the um, the obvious replacement and, yeah, did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Cam Mooney is the Will Schofield of 2018, you realise. <laughs> Brad, Brad Shepard is Jason yeah, McCartney. exactly, yeah. Um, so At not least any... you played well, though, mate. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> very good. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Go out there and have zero. Um, so that's uh, 99, yep. like you said. I've heard you speak about it before. The next year, it could have gone two ways for you like you could yeah. you could have really it could have been again probably yeah. the end of the, the footy going yeah. well you, you, you said my best year yeah 2000 was my best year yeah i just had this ability to be able to go as hard as it was take on the disappointment and go got to go again with the hope that you know i would get an opportunity and there's part of me that had some frustration that year and it was just and it wasn't it wasn't right but um because because I was having a really good year, sometimes I was looking and thinking, am I, t- am I, am I teammates, they've, they've tasted success twice. But that was just, they were going fine, but that was just me just desperate to, to get another crack at it. Um, yeah. yeah, and what, what happened, like I said, obviously ended up winning it. Uh, Melbourne had our measure, but uh, I think that year too, though, we played in a final against Essendon and they beat us by 20 plus goals. But the next week in a semi, we come back and, beat Hawthorne and then yeah Melbourne Melbourne I think beat us quite convincingly but but yeah in the end it was a really strong year for me personally probably no doubt my best year but um yeah it wasn't to be so that was the uh, Olympic year 2000 and the grand final was early September and off we went on an amazing footy trip again with the North Boys to, to Mexico and Vegas well so I know these footy trips you know, Adam Simpson, Drew Petrie, Daniel yep. Pratt, Brady Rawlings, they made their way to West Coast during my career. Yeah. Um, in fairness to West Coast, early days, you know, footy trips always been quite a big part of that football club as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I got there at the end of 06, so I saw a fair bit going on. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit going on. Mum, mum ran in the radio station, SEN, in, um, in, uh, in January because – that that off season, um, they'd been to Vegas. They won the flag. They went to Vegas. Fair yeah. bit went on there, and there's a lot of outside noise. Anyway, yeah. Jan, who you might have met, Jan, my mum. Yep. Um, she rang SEN and um, just was teeing off at anyone that she was defending the club. Yeah. Because they they were great for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was instilled in me as a young age. Uh, that was the last time mum was allowed to speak to the media. Actually, <laughs> had a, a couple of quiet words to mum. She hasn't been on the podcast. Not yet. <laughs> no, she, she was very guess. close to last week. Um, but it was always instilled in me the footy trip element was as important as playing. And I know that yeah. might sound whatever, but I, I know you'll agree yeah. that the connections that you can build with people away from the club, having some beers and yeah. not being in that elite high pressure environment, it's very important. And I still think it is important. And I think maybe some yep. clubs are moving away from it, but yeah, no, we, uh, I've got no doubt, like just that ability. And there was a, when was it? It might've been my, um, oh, it was 2002. When we went away, that might have been like Drew Petrie spoke about. It might have been his first year at the club. Another young guy, Daniel Harris, and some of those young guys that come away with us, they naturally enough come into the system. They're a bit different now. They say a bit more, but probably hardly spoken a word to anyone, and they're just trying to learn and ply their trade as eighteen-year-olds. But to get them away in that environment and they relax and loosen up a bit and have a bit of fun, their next years were so much better. Um, because it felt like they, they had that away from the, the pressures of the week to week. They just became, you know, really well connected with the group. So it was, it was something that North had, like I said, and the, the numbers were always big and they were always, um, yeah, even before I got there, they were just wonderful trips, some exotic places, but it was only ever four, five, six days. But then it was the boys would then break off in groups and travel the world. Um, like that year, the Olympic year, there was a group of us that went to Munich because 
beer festival, you get Greek islands because your season's finished that, that month earlier. Um, so that connection piece for that group um, was was something that was the envy of so many other clubs. Like a restaurant in um, near the uh, Vic Market in Melbourne, Dom Camillo's, you know, we'd go there for lunch. There'd be 10, 15 of us. The Essendon boys would come in, there'd be one or two of them, they'd see us and they'd walk out. They just didn't, it was something that they then built around that 99, 2000, that earlier, but they, they, they just felt intimidated and the, the closeness of, of, of our group. So there's no doubt had a big part in why we were successful. And I'm sure we'll, you would have seen it with West Coast. We see it here at the Giants. We've got so many players from in the state. There's, there's minimal local talent. Um, and what there is, that's generally, you know, regional New South Wales or ACT. So the, the strength of the, the group, that is your family type thing. So it can be quite powerful. Yeah, it's um, it's it's remarkable. I, I used to try and get as much out. Of, I was Fines Master at West Coast, and yeah, big part of our uh, funding for the footy trip came yeah. from Fines. But um, I remember some stories from Simo around uh, the North Melbourne fundraising abilities. Like, did you used to do like a players barbecue every year that you'd you'd get you'd get yeah. all the fan, fans would buy tickets to come down to a barbecue. It was a big, yeah, there was a big draw. There was there was a there was players might have won it. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was there was some of the things I learned off Sim. I was like, "Geez, you boys are almost funding the footy club at yeah, stages." Yeah, no, there was a, there was a couple of other events that, um, yeah, you could probably talk about them openly in the eighties and nineties, but not in twenty twenty three. Okay, not, very good. Not a um, but hockey. they did get some good funds to contribute towards forty four blokes going away. <laughs> and the, the other great thing I should give you a good mention is um, when you got a captain like Wayne Carey went out of his way to make that. That was the mm. the big thing, and there was some lower end obviously you have rookies and that couldn't really afford and I, I know that the fundraising piece was big to get them on board but i it's fair to say i know him and probably arch and others would also probably chip in to make sure these young guys got away as well yeah that's interesting isn't yeah. it? i don't think people maybe from afar they see the footy trip and say oh people carrying on get on yeah. the piss yeah that that helped you guys win games yeah it did no doubt right yeah no doubt no so doubt. um i mean the footy trip element you're on a footy trip in 2002 aren't you so I'd been, I'd been to, uh, we'd been to New Orleans for five days and I suppose the irony of all that, we've seen what's happened in September 11, the year before, and mm. we got a footy chip to New Orleans. And I initially, well, that was one of the organizers. I was at that stage, cause obviously, um, I didn't know whether I was going to go on or not. Cause Narissa and I, and my wife were getting married in December that year. And then as it got closer, I thought, ah, yeah, I need to be there. <laughs> I've organised a lot of this. I need to be there. <laughs> but the, the irony of it all is you're going there and you do have a level of apprehension because the world's a different place then after those um, terrorist attacks in America. And we're going to New Orleans. And, yeah, we're there for five days. It was just an amazing trip. And then, once again, guys stayed, states, went on to other parts of the world. And there was a, a group that came back to Australia. But Mick and I came back here to Sydney and – Mick Martin, that is, but we're going to Bali the next day just for, just for a week, catch up with some mates from um, from Perth who are over there. So yeah, we've we've done the footy trip, which I thought, you know, like I said, after what had happened a year, you're a bit apprehensive about, and then yeah, get to get to Bali, and then you get caught in a terrorist attack. Yeah. So after really only arriving that sort of afternoon, does I mean we've spoken about your footy journey before um, 2002. But, but, but clearly, there's not many people that have moments in their life that can actually reflect on footy as just as footy. Like sometimes yeah, yeah. people can get really caught up with yeah. the football bubble. And you've been in footy, oh, right, your yeah, whole life. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, you know, I, I, I'd assume given what happened in Bali that year, yeah, it puts things in perspective. Yeah, it does. So the fact that what happened in footy and missing out on that premiership medallion and things like that, um, it doesn't it doesn't bother me to, to be honest. Like yeah. it, I'm sure if I hadn't gone through something like this, it would still eat away at me, but um, I'm just grateful that after unfortunately going through that, you, you live to fight another day. So it does put everything into perspective. And like you said, footy, it's amazing. It's been just so wonderful for me and continues to be so. Like I'm 49 now and I started at 16 and that's the only industry I've been in. That's all I've done and it's just super. Um, but yeah, when you go through battles and, and everyone's got a story, different battles with, um, health or the terrorist attack that I and others went through, it, it just puts everything back into perspective. So 
Um, yeah, you never think you're going to ever go through something like that. But I suppose for me, you think how unlucky, but I only think about that for a moment because from the moment it happened, I just feel unbelievably fortunate every step of the way that I was able to make it through and come out the other side, um, yeah, getting life back to normal, really. Mick Martin was um, yep. with, with you. How close is your connection with him? Given? Yeah, it's always – it was it was a really good connection at the footy club. continues to be so, but I think your footy club mates, and, and especially when you move away and you're in a state and you're not in Melbourne, but your footy club mates, to me, they're like your great schoolmates. So it doesn't matter where you are uh, in Australia or anywhere in the world, and you mightn't even speak to them much on the phone, but when you catch up, it's like yesterday. Um mm -hmm. And we certainly had that. I remember going back uh, for the 99 Premiership reunion and there's got some guys I'd seen regularly, some I hadn't seen for, for years and, and the great thing, the staff as well. And that day, it's just like you're with them a week ago. <laughs> so that's great. But yeah, I'm Mick being with me in that situation, I'm just always extremely grateful and he knows it, that yeah, if it wasn't for his help and support in that uh, initial stages, like I don't know what I would have done even... Even though it was the tenth time I'd been to Bali, I, I don't know where I would have went to. He sort of was able to guide me up the road and chuck me on the back of a, a motorbike with a Balinese motorcyclist and got me back to the Hard Rock Hotel where we were staying. Which most people think, "What are you doing? Why aren't you going to a hospital?" But I think Mick had been there half a dozen times before, um, and in his wisdom, all he knew was, well, "Let's get back to the hotel because there's generally a doctor on duty there, and at least we'll get some treatment." So, yeah. So without Mick being there in that situation, yeah, I just don't know. What I would have done and where I would have went. People, people listening to this have been to Bali. I've yeah, been there a hundred yeah. times. Sounds like you have as well, pre, yeah. and you've yeah. been back there obviously yeah, after. Yeah. But like a, a, a fucking bomb goes off. Yeah, like, I mean, that, you know, you're not. Yeah, it doesn't so, matter what's happening in the world at the time. No, no, that's right. I, I think if I fast forward to the Sunday morning in hospital, that became the great shock because as bad as I was, you didn't know how many others had been involved. But that Saturday night, to keep everyone calm in the emergency ward we were in, they just talked about a gas explosion. Hmm. But to find out the next day, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock, whenever it was, what had actually happened, that it was a, it was a terrorist attack. It just put a whole, shed a whole new light on, on what had happened and a bit hard to deal with, to be honest. But yeah, we, we actually had been out for dinner in Cuda and we were, once again, it's like yesterday, we're on the left-hand side. I think it was the macaroni bar. We'd had pasta feed for dinner. It's on the same side as the Sari Club. We're heading that way. And this is where I felt guilty because I said to the boys, let's go across the road to Paddy's Bar because at least we were able to hear each other, like have a chat because mm. we only got there that day. We can go across there later. If we're going there now, we're not even going to hear it. You won't even be able to hold a conversation. So when it all happens... I'm not to know what had happened at the Sari Club at the time. And like, I'm thinking, I've taken this to a place and there's a terrorist attack. But then I found out what had happened at the Sari Club. And I'm thinking, thank goodness we yeah. went to Paddy's. Now in Paddy's, we had no idea at the time, been there 15, 20 minutes, but the suicide bomb was only five meters from where we're standing. So we, we are very, very lucky, that's for sure. Fuck. But I, yeah, I, I would be 95% confident if we'd been in, probably the Sari club that the four of us probably don't make it out. So, so. Mick, Mick, I mean, Mick Martin, for me growing up, right, I've been back my whole career. Yeah. I used to fucking love Mick. Yeah, yeah. I was a Geelong fan, mate. Yeah. So maybe that's why I liked him. That, yeah, that yeah. Go, have, yeah. Know, maybe. What was that, 94, I reckon? But, but he, Tudor. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. The way, it sounds silly, but like I was just such a footy fan, still am, that big Mick Martin, this, like yeah. he, he was the guy that, you know, saved you. Really. Yeah, like, yeah. It doesn't, it just sounds sounds weird, but I almost yeah. look at him and be like, "Well, that's him." Isn't yeah, it? no, it is. It is. He's just got a heart of gold. Like he's this this gentle giant, really, and just hilarious too, Mick. And he's still the boys. We got we talk about paganisms. We've got just as many Mick stories, but um, <laughs> yeah, he. So when I made it out the front, I was on my own, and I'm looking at the building and some blaze and just tumbling down. I thought, oh, I just thought I'm never going to see Mick again. My mate Peter Hughes from Perth and his mate Gary Nash and. But then Mick appeared through the smoke and rubble and it was just just so random that four of us could be together. And here's Mick, uh, some minimal burn injuries. He had the perforated eardrums because the, the blast was just deafening. Um, 
but yeah, just just pretty minimal injury. So he was able to take control and sort of drag me up the road. So without that, I I don't know how it would have been. But it, I look back now, and and even Mick spending time with me in the hospital, and then when I went in for surgery, then he doesn't see me again, and and he can't find me anywhere. And um, myself and others that were injured badly, you, as much as you're in a really bad way, you probably you take in a bit of what's around you, but you're just too bad, so you're not taking in as much. But for Mick, who had minor injuries, or the volunteers, or they're helping, or just the medical teams, the horrific scenes that they had to witness, there's no doubt the mental scars for Mick are far, far deeper and greater than me. And that's purely because I was just in such a bad way. I saw a bit and it wasn't great, but I was just in too bad a shape. So for me, it was more the physical injuries were far worse, but Mick probably more the mental side of things, which, um, you know, that's, that's really tough. And when I have been back, you, you make a connection with Aussies that live there and expats and you hear some of the remarkable stories of what they were doing. And it's just like, there's so much focus and attention rightfully on people who are injured or lost loved ones and the support networks around them, but making sure that these people that aren't injured, that did so much and saw so much that they get the right level of support as well to help them through it. Mm. Um, because no doubt the pain for them um, in a mental space would would be as great, if not greater, than us. C clearly, uh, the biggest moment in your life. Uh, it can go both ways. Yeah, yep. incredibly fortunate. You do get back to Australia. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, <laughs> is there any point that footy? Like, I just feel like you go through that part of your life, and it's like adversity and coming back and. Yeah. See, like at what point does that does that kick in for you? Like the yeah. like is that is that why you're able to? Yeah, yeah well, no like, doubt. Like the I just think of the disciplines that get ingrained in you from a sixteen year old being an elite sports person, and then the experiences along the way, and probably more from the the hardships maybe than the, than the highlights. But it just everything kicked into gear. It was like although I wasn't necessarily thinking about footy at the time, all the goal setting bang okay what's short term that i can focus on well we'll get married on the 14th of december so that's that's the number one goal within that though i'm in um intensive care i get to the burns ward so i need to meet my physio who's my physio can we get a plan in place can i see you twice a day all i could do my hands were a mess it was like those stress balls start squeezing them but we love structure as players we live on structure Give me the whiteboard. Let's map it out. So just these major milestone was the wedding. Um, but to get there, just these little milestones along the way. And as we know, it's not always smooth sailing. But when you tick some of them off, um, your aspirational uh, probably didn't know whether I could really do it. But you're just blocking that. It's all positive. But you tick off a few of these milestones and you build that belief again. And then... Uh, yeah, ultimately I got myself in a situation, um, the doctors, physio, surgeons, amazing, but they, they were confident that we need to postpone the wedding. I'd need eight to 10 weeks in hospital in rehab. And just the extent of my injuries, playing at the elite AFL level, it's just highly unlikely. So once again, you're disappointed to hear that, but you just take it on board and I'm try just trying to grab on any positives. And I go, okay, in their line of work, they, absolutely need to be conservative. They can't get people's hopes up. So then I'm going, okay, it's 28 at the time. I'm a lead athlete. I'm fit. I'm healthy. Surely that plays a role. I didn't know, but I was hoping. So you grab onto the positivities. And, and, and in the end, we're able to tick a few things off. And yeah, I got out in like three and a half weeks. Um, wedding went ahead as scheduled, um, which was just an amazing day. And then like it was always then about returning to footy to not just play one AFL game, but just to continue my career. Now, I didn't share with my wife, Narissa, that I started to think about footy a lot earlier than what led on to her because it was all about the wedding, obviously. <laughs> but footy had entered the equation in my own calculations. And she, she knows that too. Yeah, she knows that now. Um, but yeah, obviously it was, yeah, the wedding was amazing. A little bit of time off. And then I just returned to training as normal in January with the other boys, albeit I had a different program and, and, I, and I was back into it and, I think the biggest thing for me, you talk about ticking off those milestones along the way. My biggest one was when I was physically ready to, to play again. And it was my 29th birthday. And at North Melbourne at the time, our reserve team was affiliated with Port Melbourne. 
in the VFL, the old VFA team. And it was actually their reserve grade. So it was a really low level game. It was a Friday night at Carlton's um, home ground training base. And going into that game, I didn't have any fears for my injuries. And I had the garments on both legs and both arms and long sleeve for protection, gloves, because my hands were a mess, a bit more protection. I wasn't fearful of any of that. And I would break open grafted skin every time I hit someone, I hit the ground. All I was worried about, <laughs> can I still get a kick? <laughs> <laughs> so playing that day, as, as much as, as amazing it was to return to AFL, that was a pivotal moment because yes, I was ambitious and some would say you're very hopeful, but once I'd ticked that off and thankfully I got a couple of kicks, I, I knew I'd be able to do it. It really was what changed in that period, the longer it took, a bit more of a realization, understanding what I was up against with my injuries, how long it might take to make a full recovery, balancing health with maybe some opportunities that were presenting life after football that I was I'd neglected in the planning around that. And as hard as it was, ultimately a month before I returned to play AFL, Narissa and I knew that whenever it is I get back, it will change and it will just be just be the one game. So we sat on that and thankfully for us it was um yeah, it was only a month later and yeah, we'll, we're able to return and put up, pull on that kangaroos jumper again. Everyone sees the that moment, right? I think it's up there with some of the great moments of AFL ever. You returning to play, but as you're speaking about, for you personally, like yeah. playing in the VFL resis, <laughs> and you know, probably before that, being able to fucking walk again. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. They're, they're, it's not it's not those you know 120 minutes nah. for you. It might be for people who've watched yeah. it, but for you, well, it was it was the you talk about the journey through your career. Well, this was the journey of this period of recovery. And, you know, that amazing support network I had around me. So obviously my wife was just remarkable day and night by my side, my family, her family. Um, but then it was that team of physios and surgeons. And there's people at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne now that it's a bit like they're your old schoolmates now. We don't speak regularly, but when we catch up, it's like yesterday because they were remarkable. Um, so it was the journey of that group because whatever we do in life, you have your goals and aspirations, you can work really hard, but you've got to have a great team around you because you, you just don't get there on your own. And, and I certainly had that. So to be able to get back and play again, um, not only for me, but for that group was, was really special. And it probably wasn't until after the game that I just realized the enormity and impact it may have had on so many others. Because I certainly wasn't lying in hospital intensive care thinking, geez, how can I impress upon a few people here? I just wanted to get life back on track. And for me, after what had happened, uh, a full recovery was, okay, we're planning a wedding. We've got, that's got to go ahead. And I need to go back to work. Now work was different, but I just, that to me is making a full recovery. So yeah, after that last game, a function we went to, which was like after winning a premiership, the victory room at, at uh, what is it now, Marvel, it was Eddie had at the time. That's when it dawned on me when I'm looking down while I was interviewed, had over a hundred guests there that night, seeing family and friends, but also some of the emergency service teams, some people were involved and injured, some people that lost loved ones. Um, to see those people and see the happiness that that night had brought to them is really special and a really like privileged position to be in because that wasn't my focus. My focus was to just get our lives back together after what had happened. Footy clubs are one of the great levelers, whether, yeah. whether they be loss whether it be ups and downs and form whether it yeah. be mood relationships whatever it is being around footy clips are one of the great levelers so given you've been through life trauma um and what you'd been through in your footy journey i know almost the answer to this question you're not just walking into that team because they feel sorry for you footy no. clubs are footy club mm. who's your coach Who's the coach at the time? That well, has to, you have to get you have to get a game. They're not yeah, just going to play it because you're Jace McCartney. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So it was an innocent, like it was a really interesting period because our coach, our longtime coach and mentor, and Dennis, he'd left at the end of uh, twenty. That was a two thousand and two. He left the end of that year, so he'd gone to Carlton. Huh. So well, it was the end of yeah, it was oh two. So um, Danny Laidley is our coach so first time senior coach and he's dealing with well first and foremost i didn't know when mick and i went away we've come off this really successful era and with a new coach coming in dennis has gone club probably moving in a different direction 
Mick and I didn't even know. Mick's 13 games short of 300, two-time premiership player, one or two BNFs. We didn't even know if we were getting a contract. So that's the unknown of an off-season. Now, they give me a contract. They don't even know if I'm going to survive. They gave Mick the arse, which is hilarious. <laughs> and Mick went to Carlton, played 13 games with Dennis coaching. And I remember him carrying his mum on the ground. He's 300 through the banner and he did his calf. And I reckon he only played half a quarter, but he got the 300. Massive contribution to the Carlton Footy Club, Mick. He'd be one of their all-time greats. Not. But he got the 300. But yeah, but Lades' coach is dealing with uh, – bef- well, they give me a contract. They didn't know I'd survive. Mm. They certainly didn't think I'd ever play again. Mm. But I'm just so grateful they gave me the opportunity to, to still be on the list. But it was the game against uh, Carlton with Lades coaching against um, Dennis. So that was before I returned. The game against the Crows. Wayne Carey playing against North Melbourne oh. for the first time. That was that year. That year. And then you've got me trying to get back and play again. So that is a lot to deal with in your first year as a senior coach. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thankfully I got there. Like it was round 11, I think. Like as we all say, I'm pissed off. I reckon it should have been a lot earlier. But anyway. <laughs> you did your calf, old a, boy. Yeah, I did. It's old man. I did. It's um, old man well, the old, the old man syndrome on the calf, it's because I had some decent shrapnel wounds as well and there's a whole bone <laughs> yeah. in my calf. So, yeah. <laughs> But it is an old man's injury. But um, that, that was one that it's funny you mention that because that was probably maybe three weeks before I returned, ultimately the AFL, and that nearly derailed the whole thing because I knew I was really close. Uh, you're just that desperate to get back by this stage and then you just think the whole world is conspiring against you. Like I, it, it was a, a poor me, why me moment. I'm sitting at home, Narissa's having to put up with my bullshit, but I'm going, Jesus, this, I, I've missed out. I haven't played in been at clubs or won premierships, I lose one. I, who gets rubbed out in a prelim and misses one? Who goes on holiday and Buddy gets caught up in a terrorist attack? Like, <laughs> now I'm trying to get back. I'm nearly there. This happens. It's not meant to be. They can all jam it. I'm finished. I've had enough. And thankfully, she was really supportive. And I think she might have spoke to <clears throat> Anthony Stevens and Glenn Archer and even my mate Husey. And once I settled and got a they sort of put it all in perspective, going, geez, uh, I reckon you've been through a bit worse than a calf injury. You're going <laughs> to you're gonna let this derail you. And um, yeah, it was amazing. Within a week or so, I was back playing. And that's when I was crystal clear that, that whenever it was, I'd, I'd play and finish up. So yeah, I had to earn the right, um, which is, I didn't want to be gifted again. Yeah. It's work really hard to get back. And um, ultimately, you just wanted to go out and perform and it's about the team. So I just wanted to win that night. Like I think playing Richmond that night, Friday night's obviously big in the AFL, big in Melbourne. We were probably two of the higher ranked Melbourne clubs at the time. So it was a really important game. So yeah, you wanted to earn the right and then you wanted to, you know, hopefully be able to perform. And like the game was pretty remarkable. Like once again, I talked about those late nineties grand finals and not much rotations. Well, certainly starting on the interchange bench, there was very limited rotations in the early 2000s. So I spent the whole first quarter on the bench. <laughs> I, I, knew that, um, I knew that I'd probably get used as a forward and I had the gloves. So in the warm up, I trialed a new pair of gloves and they were magnificent for marking. But the set shot, they're, they're just a bit too sticky. <laughs> so thankfully I reverted to the ones I'd been wearing all season. So there's still a bit of grip, but it was a bit easier to kick. Like if you're back, it wouldn't matter. You just handball it so you'd be right. Correct. Take 12 intercept marks and away spoil. you go. Yeah, strap, spoil. strap it into a fist and just yeah. run around like that. But then I, I came on at quarter time and uh, I'll never forget it was the uh, so it was the southern end there at, um, at Docklands and it was the Richmond cheer squad end and they stood as one and applauded and it was like, I've never had that. <laughs> and it worked well because I think I gave away two free kicks and maybe had one kick or a handball. I got you. Third quarter, what did I do third quarter? Maybe another free kick or two against a point, nothing much. Three quarter time. And it was only, um, we'd had our leadership meeting on the Friday morning after team meeting. And that's when I told the other leaders that win, lose or draw, I'll be finishing. Right. So they're the only ones that knew. And I'm going in there and I'm thinking, shit, I haven't gone well here. I'm going to be back on the bench. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thankfully, my name was still up there. Um, and early in the last quarter, David King kicks one forward and I got in front and marked, kicked a goal. And I was absolutely shitting myself lining up for that one because the glove again, although it was the older ones, I knew they were a bit grippy. Um, but that went through. And then very, very late in the game, I think we we're down by a couple of points and I was able to, the glove come in handy again, ground ball, hold my opponent back and it was like Velcro. <laughs> and I've got <laughs> swung around in a tackle and I've dribbled this wobbly punt that went about six metres and people say now, oh, it would have went through. It wouldn't have. <laughs> it would have been, you know, they would have scooped it up five metres short. But Lee Harding, um, Lee was super quick as a player, but even quicker running towards goal. And he just swooped on it and scored. And ultimately we held on, uh, I forget now, two or three points we, we won by. So it was, um, yeah, it's just so, like to go through everything I and we went through and then I look at our wedding day and how perfect it was. And I look at how that return game, how it panned out. And it's just like, I just couldn't have scripted it to be um, that way. It was like an absolute fairy tale. So, and, I, and I, it makes me think about Dennis again, because Dennis was there at the game, the start of the night. And I think he ended up penning a letter to me, which um, was the forward to the book I ended up writing. And the paganisms would, I was thinking about a lot and he used to talk about, he'd talk about luck and he'd say, look, ultimately luck is all that's left over once you've tried and tried your hardest. And I think about that period of what I had to go through with my support team just to, to get back and play. And it was so much hard work by so many people and we, we got the fairy tale ending, which, um, and my teammates were so special. Like I've seen the vision of my stuff that many times, but if I just go away from that and look at the last two or three minutes of that game, when the game's on the line, and these guys did it every week. They were seriously good footy team. But the guys that knew I was finishing up, it's like their efforts were kamikaze like every week. Steve-O, Simo, Arch, Shannon Grant. It was like they went to another level again. And ultimately it was them giving me the opportunity to really in a way that was my premiership. Yeah. And and they they provided that, so they were they were amazing. How bloody good was there? Uh, after a little while, was there any itch to to want to keep playing? You know, like you, you'd sort of committed pre-game <laughs> to. Do you know? Do you know what? That's a great question because you know what happened that game. Lee Colbert, my teammate, got a ruptured spleen, and he was playing back, and I played there my whole career virtually. So it did cross my mind. He was out for probably twelve weeks. I was like it. Have I gone too early? Yeah. The John Farland comeback. It was only a fleeting moment, but <laughs> it, it is, it is interesting because um, I reckon later that year, like once I stopped the combative nature of the training and the games, my healing process, like just, I felt so fresh within myself, especially when you're not breaking open grafted skin and, and doing things like that. So I was still active with my training, but I just felt so much better. And I reckon about seven or eight weeks later, and I'm still doing a bit of work at the club. They still have me helping out with some coaching and things during the week. And you sort of crosses your mind, oh, I reckon I could still do this. <laughs> and I played, uh, was it that year or the next year? Whether it was later that year or the following year, uh, my wife's from uh, Millicent in South East South Australia, and I played a couple of games for Padola. Um, and I realised pretty quickly that, no, I can't stop this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say kick. Uh, yeah. no, I was, you know, when, when you end up in your first game, and Panola had won the premiership the year before, and a mate was coaching, and I forget who the side we come up against, and they had a guy that played a heap of sample footy and kicked a heap of goals, and he was torching us. So I've ended up going back and playing on it full back. And obviously I was able to nullify him, but it's like, hey, I didn't come to play a couple of games to go and play fullback yeah. in the country. <laughs> I don't need this. And I probably think I didn't, I, I played in Bali at the end of that year, which was really special for the, the geckos. Uh, many of people have played some games for the Bali geckos, but it was um, around the weekend of the one year, first year memorial service. Um, so that was great to play in their nine size carnival. And um, yeah, 34, five degree heat, high humidity and long sleeves and garments and that not ideal I, I nearly passed out a few times <laughs> but the same thing i'm there to have a bit of enjoyment and there was 
other Asian teams there, but then there's a couple of Aussie teams on footy trips. They added sides, and we're playing Bateman's Bay. And next minute, I've got the arm across, like treading on my toes. <laughs> and then I've gone in the ruck, and they wore Port Power, uh, Port Adelaide uh, jumpers. And I went in the ruck, and I couldn't jump. And the ruckman was built like Matty Primus. <laughs> And he's dug the knees straight into my ribs. And then <laughs> I, I've resorted to, um, bugger this, I'm going to start a blue. <laughs> so I thought, and we ended up making the final that day and we played that side again, but I couldn't play up because the prime minister was there. So I had to be on my best behavior. And <laughs> other than that, a couple of EJ Witten legends games, but I'm just, as much as I love it, I'm so reluctant to play now just because take the barley out which I had no surgery through my AFL career. Mm. And then all that happens and you move on with what you do with work. If you get injured in an AFL player, it's part and parcel. You got the best medical uh, team around you and the best rehab facility. So you just get on with it. But now if you go and do it, how do you fit the, that in around your work? Your work's now your priority. So yeah, so I've done it a couple of times and got out of it okay. So not willing to, to risk an ACL or a busted yes, shoulder. Now, now, you did you end up coming back the other week for, yeah, the, for the twos? I did. How'd you go? Yeah, it was fine. It's not like your story, but um, there was an element of fulfilment for me. Yeah. Because I, fin- I retired, but, you know. Yeah, I, you left a bit in the would, tank, didn't would you? Have been you left a bit in the tank well, when you retired. Would have been daily. I, I don't know where I would have sat. And so played waffle year out, broke yeah. my back. So the story you're telling about work. Yeah. I was playing at waffle, mate. And yeah. Pretty much lucky to have physio treatment there. Yeah. So I broke my back, three vertebrae, didn't didn't couldn't walk for three months. Basically, like, sorry, I could walk around, couldn't yeah. couldn't jog, couldn't run, nothing. It was stiff as a board. For yeah. so I stopped playing, stopped exercising, and then um, didn't play waffle the following year. And then this year, you know, huge trouble with the injuries. Basically, yeah, there's no one available. No and I was in with Simo doing a media thing with him, and he jokingly said, "You know, oh, you play play full forward for us." And I said, "Yeah, I'll do it. No yeah. worries." Thinking the same as you, I've still I can still do it. <laughs> now look, I won't go through it all, but I kicked a goal, got in the best of my first game. So I mean, oh, got, for a backman, it's pretty good, mate. It's a great story. Now you see what I've done here. I've had enough of speaking about yeah, myself, yeah. so I've just turned this. <laughs> no, it's sorry. now it's now the Will Schofield no, uh, we're not, pod. We're, we're Wait, not, one, focus one last, on one last question before we do that. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you just mentioned the prime minister before. What did he say to you on the on the phone before the comeback uh, game? Yeah. Not your normal prep for a game, is it, when the Prime Minister calls? <laughs> this John Howard? Yeah. Yeah, I was lying on the couch, had a little apartment in Albert Park at the time, and hello, it's this is the Prime Minister. <laughs> and it was just about John here. Uh, congratulations, you've been really inspiring for so many. And once again, it's a level of uncomfort for me because, hey, I, I know so many others went through similar, if not worse than me, and the only reason that I had a lot of focus is just my work was footy and it's obviously such a popular sport and obviously the media play a role and um, through my work, it was something I suppose people could identify with this, you know, us getting on and recovering. So yeah, I didn't choose for that. So he did, he, he just spoke about that. Like, it was congratulations and you've been very inspiring and good luck. And yeah, I don't think Mick got a call. <laughs> 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 oh, it's so good. Just back when hanging shit on each other. Now, it's both, now back to you, right? You turn it to me, but I do have a story involving both you and I. Yeah. So you, you uh, called the cannons. You spent some time coaching the Tech Cup there. Yeah, I went, I went down there and helped out a little bit when I was at the AFL doing the National Academy, which I really enjoyed. Fremantle development coach. Yes. And you were a runner. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did, weren't you? Yep. You used to run there. Yep. I know you were. Yeah, no, no, I remember this. So, Subiaco, first, would have been probably the first... Um, Derby we had. How do you remember this? So I got a good memory. Well, <laughs> so I'm out there minding my own business as an AFL player, Dan. Right, just just trying to get a kick. Probably not even get a kick. Trying to stop someone else from getting a kick. <laughs> out of nowhere, probably in yellow. That's probably not in the pink at that stage. No, I wouldn't have been bright, pink. I wouldn't have done it. Bright, fl- <laughs> bright fluoro yellow. <laughs> oh, I see this literal flash across the front of my face, like within thirty centimeters. Like it was, it was like a player. Could have been flash. It wouldn't have been that. Quick. It was flash, mate. <laughs> Some blurs come <laughs> running through with with some expletives along the way. So I don't know what what was said, but it was directed directly at me. And I'd done something, probably done something off the ball. And Mr. McCartney here, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. McCartney, running uh, water, no, running messages for the Freo Dockers. 
is out there as the enforcer and he was he was getting into me and i never forget it because i a huge footy fan growing up yeah. i used to watch you play or watch these moments we've spoken about so i know i, I, I you you and amongst others was someone i looked up to and this bloke out there going <laughs> something along the lines of what are you fucking doing out here Scofield? i wouldn't have said that <laughs> so hang on i've got to get this right what are we i was petrified wa derby or derby uh derby derby yeah so I was only at Freo that one year and yeah, had to the, the this management role come up at the dog. So we come back, but we were loving our time in Perth, but obviously as a development coach, there was three or four of us then. There was no soft cap we had to worry about and yeah, clubs that were financial like West Coast and Freo, you'd just load up on your staff to put the best program on your players. And we would rotate the runners role between the, the three of us. So it was my turn. I assume it was the first one. So being a competitor, yeah, I got caught up in it all a bit and you used to have two runners then one was to just a runner and do some messages but the other one was your development coach so it could be really structural get blokes in the right position and occasionally abuse the opposition um, <laughs> but I reckon I, the only reason I remember I don't remember having a go at you but I remember having words with uh, I reckon it might have been Adam Selwood probably yeah that's sort of time there's a good verbal bar. And who else would have been playing then? Was um Bo Waters. Yeah, but who uh, was the Brett full Jones, full forward, like Ash Hansen might have been playing. No, I don't know who they'd done. But I also remember as a North player. Ben McKinley. We had some fierce rivalry with the West Coast boys at the time too. So I remember as a player at the back end. Was it big Troy Wilson? Yeah. Yeah. Troy Wilson, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I had some yeah, so it was always good fun. Like, as a North player too, North had really good support in the West, and I reckon it would have been the seventies and eighties. Some of the recruiting, um, yeah. So it was always there's a bit of rivalry there, but yeah, I just obviously got caught up in the uh, Freo West Coast <laughs> rivalry. See, uh, just see the eyes, and it was yeah, scary. I was yeah. intimidated. It couldn't have been a flash though. <laughs> it was a flash, mate. I'll tell you what, you were probably lining me up. A I'll... flash, and then the calf goes. <laughs> uh, the, the last part I want to speak about, um, given all of this. Right, and 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 yeah, I want to speak out less about your current role at GWS general manager, but yeah. but that time at the Bulldogs, given uh, no premiership success, plenty of sixty two years it had been between yeah. the first one, yeah. So helping helping do that, you started the footy club in two thousand eleven. Yep. So that list build, yeah, yeah, was you know you'd have to have your fingers in it. Yeah, it was it was great. Like, so the club had been pretty successful in terms of that had a period of probably three prelims in a row and fell short. And then it would have been nine and 10, just started to fall away with a bit more of an aging group. So when I come in, there was, they hadn't had a list manager had fallen on the GM of footy. So I was really lucky, like Simon Del Rimple just started out and recruiting there probably a year earlier and he had an offside away McCraw. So to come in and join that team and we had a, pretty clear plan unfortunately we just lost Callum Ward he decided that he was going to take up the opportunity here at the Giants so that meant the rules then we had a compensation pick uh, but you could use it over a two-year period and you got to choose but you had to choose you couldn't wait until the end of the year to see where you finished because it was a pick after where you finished you had to make the call in March so we were pretty bold we made the call in March of that next year um, and as it turned out, we had pick five and then we had pick six. So it was really important. We were, we'd identified that core group of senior players that were great people, great role models, great bulldogs that we wanted to keep. And then we identified some other guys that had been, had been great players and they're good people, but they probably had some currency because we needed to get back into the draft. So that year... Jake Stringer and Jack McRae. So that was that was great. And and Lockie, father sons have been good to the Bulldogs and been very good to Geelong as well. So that was a nice hit straight up. And then the next year, uh, we were starting to progress a bit. We were still low and pick four. And and that ended up being Marcus Bond and Pelly. So Decent. you had <laughs> those four who had um, played significant roles, obviously, in the, in the premiership at a very young age. And then Brendan McCartney was coach, had built a really strong foundation, especially around his craft and contest method and different things. But uh, there was a falling out there at the end of 2004. We, we haven't got a coach. Um, our captain, Ryan Griffin, wants to leave. 
we'd been looking throughout the year at the key forwards and we identified funny enough what I do now, but where I work now, but it was, um, there was three at the Giants, Cameron, Patton and Boyd. And the other one's Tom Lynch at the Gold Coast. Could we get any of them? And we got a big bag full of money to spend. <laughs> and um, it became clear early in the piece, but Tommy was probably the one that was gettable, that he's only in uh, the system a year. So it was still a big, big risk because uh, he'd obviously had a very dominant junior career, but he's only one year into the AFL. And as we know, it's a different kettle of fish. So. But we didn't know how we'd get a trade done. So we didn't talk to anyone. We sat on it. And then when Ryan decided he wanted to go, I knew it would be giant. So that that was the golden ticket to maybe be able to do this board deal. So, But I think it's, 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 that was so important. And Tommy played an enormous part in that premiership. And mm. obviously what no one really knew then, he was he – was, battling a little bit himself too and he's doing an amazing job now which is great but there's a couple other things like some you talk about the role players you can get in and we're able to get Joel Hamling from Geelong who hadn't played a game obviously at Frio now but Joel the only reason he hadn't played a game is a key back at Geelong and are you getting past Scarlett and Taylor, Enright and Taylor. back here and like there's so many there Taylor um, so he come in and like a guy who was at the Swans um Shane Biggs, like they come in and they end up for a year or two, they just played really important roles. So it was a combination of like that, that team we had that I was working with in terms of Simon and Wayne and then others come to it. And we had a clear path and we had this five year vision and you can get lucky at like, we didn't know when Macca went out, what was going to happen. And, and Luke Beveridge come in and the players we brought in. And then we had these older players that were just reinvigorated under Luke's style of play. And we had the foundation around contest. And Luke's first year was 2015. And we played some really good footy and got pipped in a prelim, uh, sorry, in an elimination final against Adelaide. And the next year, uh, everyone talks about, oh, you come from seventh and there was a buy the first week. And yeah, yeah, we did come from seventh, but that was a year where the comp was really hot. I think we were seventh with 15 wins. 15 wins normally has you around top four. so. Um, it was just an amazing final series because we went to, we played three out of the last game we lost. Yes. So then it was a week off. We'd had injuries. The week off, we were able to bring four or five players back in. So in name, the paper looked really good, but we're worried about how much work they got in and probably a bit underdone. West Coast at Subi, you would have you been playing? Yeah, I remember that. So we had a hot start. You're hot or yeah. you're just hot. Yeah. Just the team it, was It just, just clicked. Yeah. Um, it was, sometimes you play teams and, you, they feel unstoppable. Yeah. Anything you do, uh, Rich, Richmond, when that when they're yeah. off, you know, just one little touch yeah. and it's uh, that, yep. that's what that was. And we, we were having a bit of trouble scoring and, uh, yeah, we were just – we were red hot. And so the next week, well, you're playing the three-time reigning premiers in Hawthorne, the MCG, and a really tight first half and we just – we got going big time just before half time. We beat them. So at that stage, it's like – the, the theory with the boys was a bit of a feel like, why not us? And then the biggest obstacle was the Giants at Giants Stadium in a prelim. No one gave us a chance. And and I talked earlier about you, you're in, actively involved, but then you wish you could, now you've done that, you can see the other side of the fans. Walking into Giants Stadium that day and walking the two or 300 metres down the path area to go in, it was phenomenal, the party atmosphere. And so many Bulldog supporters. It was. It, it ended up. It felt like we're playing at Witten Oval. It was remarkable. <laughs> and that game, that was pulsating. That that was as good a prelim as you could ever imagine. And once we did that, and this, and the, the celebration after each win, some would say, "Geez, they've gone a bit over the top here." But Bevo just let the boys go, and it just it built. It was like this, you know, train with so much momentum and. And I, I hadn't been that confident going into each of the first three finals. So I was happy to be really pleasantly surprised. But then grand final day, I just knew we were going to win. And the Swans were a good side, but we just knew we'd, we'd be able to win. So, yeah, it's, I look back on that and it was just a great period to be at the club. Such fond memories. But for the supporters piece, one premiership ever and then it was a 62-year wait. Um, just, just great to be able to play it players you know a role in the background with a good team of people because everyone has five-year plans and 
often three years in, you start another five years, so you can <laughs> just keep extending your job. It's all someone else's fault. But, yeah, we there's a couple of uh, speed humps along the way. But, yeah, we got there with a group that um, yeah, Bevo had them humming. And there's you look at it, there's, there's some stars, there's some older players at the end of their career in all Australian form. And it's probably fair to say there were some misfits that fired, like, you know, at all Australian level for four weeks, for whatever reason. Where does the list manager watch the grand final from? Are you in a box? I was in the, I was in the, I was in the coach's box. Yeah, I used to sit in the coach's box. So um, uh, I'm usually pretty good. Uh, obviously, you just you're watching and looking and looking at your players. I must admit, when I was still in the list manager role for the Giants and still based in Melbourne, the first couple of years, I did um, I did have to leave the box in that 2019 prelim against Collingwood. Because uh, it was in the wet, we're all over them, and then they're, they're coming, they're coming big time, and we couldn't score, and we 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 couldn't get out of their attacking sort of thirty, and I reckon it was halfway through the last, and I was in the the MCG, the box is, is side by side, there's, so there's two areas, and I was at the back of not where the main coaches were, and I couldn't watch it anymore, so I just got up and walked out <laughs> in the car park, I'm just wandering around the car park, I went up the race. And up the race, Dave Matthews, the CEO, was there. Like, Toby was suspended. He was there. Uh, Delidio, there's four or five players. And it's down the opposite. It's down the punt road, and it's camped there. And it's it's within a kick. So I go, oh, fuck. I'm going down the rooms now. And I'm sitting down the rooms, and I'm wondering. And I thought, I'll have a look on my phone. And it's still there. And it's 30-second delay. And next minute, I hear one of our media team just run down screaming, so I ran up the race saying, oh, this is good with one. <laughs> and I'm never usually like that. And I just think, although I'd only been at the Giants, it was my second year, I was very familiar with the club from startup because I coached the National Academy team at the AFL. And a lot of the boys through that program had been foundation players at the Giants. I knew the struggles of, you know, how they started and how, how they were built. And... For others, they would talk about our club as you got all this talent and all these concessions. But within that, it, it was bloody tough. And obviously, you got to let go of a lot of good players every year back then, managing cap and things. So we'd been really good, but we'd not made a grand final. So I was just, once again, only been at the club two years, but so invested and just so wrapped for the, for the boys. And I still think about that a lot now with what we're trying to do and what we're building now with a bit of a reset. Um, I love doing what I'm doing, but I'm also very fulfilled in what I've done in life. I'm only there now to really help play a part for these guys. I want them to experience what I've been lucky enough to see firsthand and my mates at North or whether it was Adelaide, I'm desperate for them to have that opportunity. And I know you've chatted with Toby before and he's at the peak of his powers, Toby Green, and that's what we want. We want that group now that's been at the Giants for a long period of time that are now 28, 29, and they lived through the period where we were very close and couldn't get there. Our role is now that we've had this reset and it's what we can do the back half of this year, but more importantly, next year and the year after with some really good young talent go, coming through. But like at the Bulldogs, the role that um, you know, Bob Murphy and Matty Boyd and these guys played, now, Toby and Stephen Keneally and Josh Kelly are younger than those guys. But how they can help develop these young guys gives them their best chance of ultimate success now. And that's what I see. My role is just making sure we've, we've got the best people. They're doing the best job. We've got the best program. Um, so these guys can, can get a taste of what that – you've lived it, mate, and it's, it's pretty intoxicating. There's more lows in an AFL career than there are highs – but the highs are just so darn good that you, you keep chasing it. So that, that's what we're all about as a footy club. Um, but the only thing with that, we know the 17 others <laughs> with exactly the same aspirations and working just as hard and have just as many good people in management and coaching positions. So, um, yeah, like I said, I started at 16, I'm now 49. I've never left and have no intention of leaving for a while. So it's, it's, it's been so wonderful footy for me. There's no doubt about it. A remar like genuine, remarkable uh, footy story, mate, and that mm. includes uh, uh, what happened in 2002. But just a a journey. It's been. Yeah. We appreciate your time in here, mate. We we're not quite done. Got a couple of questions. No, from that's the all right. That's all right. But we no, do appreciate you coming in. No, thank you very much. Good because yeah, obviously the, you talk about 
the Bali experience and returning and things so much, but it's, yeah, it's been great to take some twists and turns and hear a little about a little bit about your comeback and everything as well, mate. <laughs> so well, I can say more afterwards. We'll turn the cameras off. I'll let you know every kick I had. I only had four of them. Um, now, social media, not social, social. We've got some questions from our audience, our fans for Excellent. you, mate. Excellent. Okay, so I want number one to be underscore Huntsman, underscore 06, underscore. Yeah, some underscores in there. Uh, who was the better coach? Uh, Lethal Lee, Malcolm Blight, or Dennis Pagan? Oh, my goodness. I've forgotten you were coached by Lethal Lee at Collingwood, of course. Uh, I'll, I'll say Dennis. And no disrespect the other two, but Dennis got the best out of me. And I was also a bit more mature and a bit older, but yeah, the others were, yeah, obviously Hall of Fame is exceptional. We, um, we save one question for our patrons, our VIP. So I'm going to save the answer to this question yep. till then. Uh, yep. This is from Connor Chocoroli. I actually can't say that. Uh, Best story with the North Boys back in the 90s. So we're going to get that for our patrons. Uh, one of the cameras are off, so you want to hear that. You can sign yeah. up to Patreon. Yeah. We've uh, got three hours. <laughs> hard to separate. Uh, right at the top, John underscore Dawson. Uh, Jason, if you weren't still in football, what would have you done instead? Yeah, I think I would have still... Yeah, it probably takes me back to the end of the Crows era before North. I would have stayed in footy. I would have played Sandful and... I would have gone down that development pathway, I think. Uh, probably would have gone into coaching. So, so thankful I didn't. <laughs> this is much better. <laughs> yeah, good. And the final one, from the Eggman. Uh, how do you like your eggs cooked? Eggs? Poached. Mm. Poached. Clean cut. We like it. Uh, Jace, thank you, mate. Um, thank you. While we're thanking you, got to thank our supporters, our sponsors, Fleet Network. Thank you for supporting the podcast. To Swimply, to Whippersnapper Whiskey, Margaret River Roasting Co., Blue Bet, Shelter Brewing Co., Leadable Cameras. Yeah, we looked after you. Don't worry about that. <laughs> oh, um, find it all. Backchatpodcast.com.au, backchatstudios.com.au. Find all the stuff there and hang around patrons for one more story from Jason McCartney. Mate, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Great to spend some time with you.